Welcome to Dodgers Dogs. I'm Casey Porter, joined by Chase Witwiska, as I am each and every week. So, Chase, welcome into Dodgers Dogs. We have a very busy show this evening, so welcome in. Appreciate it, man. Let's go. Okay, we're going to talk about J.D. Martinez. He was just signed to a one-year, $10 million contract. We're going to go over some of the reasons why I think the Dodgers picked him up, why you think he picked him up. Uh, you know, we're going to give our thoughts on the type of deal, whether we like it or not. We're also going to talk about, you know, there's always collateral damage when you do these deals, when you pick up a veteran like that. It, you know, it, it kind of displaces one of your younger guys in this situation. It looks like a Michael Bush. It's going to make it more difficult for him to pl- to have playing time. We're also going to talk about the role of Miguel Vargas. I have a lot of video on him both playing defense and offense. So we're going to go and break down lots of video on Miguel Vargas tonight. So stay tuned for that. And then <clears throat> we're going to just kind of give our final thoughts on Justin Turner, that situation, and go over all that. So a busy show tonight. Where do you want to jump in, Chase? Uh, let's start with Justin Turner. Okay, give me your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm upset about it. I really am. I liked him a lot, uh, and I think that he would have helped those young guys out a lot. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, I don't I don't know what went on in the clubhouse. I don't know what he was wanting and what he was, um, you know, what he what exactly he was seeking. Uh, maybe they told him what his role was going to be, and he didn't like it. Yeah, he got um, a two year deal, thirteen million the first year, which is kind of interesting because, you know, the Dodgers he had a sixteen million dollar club option that the Dodgers chose not to exercise and then it had a two million dollar buyout so anything you know at 13 to 14 million would have been an even deal at the from the beginning so I think the 13 million there that's interesting because if the Dodgers would have matched that that would have made 15 million which would have been almost identical to the original 16 million the Dodgers turned down yeah, I think I like. I think it's really interesting. Um, like I said, I'm not sure, um, you know, what what was said and what went on. Um, you know, I, I think that there is a possibility that they um, sat him down and kind of told him, uh, like we were talking about last week, what his role was going to be coming into the season, and he may not have liked it very much. So, yeah, no doubt. So JD Martinez, he gets signed, and there's, I think, there's some very obvious reasons why that happened. One is, you know, he's been an All Star multiple times, so he's been a great player. He's a little bit older. He's deep into his 30s. But, okay, so one year, $10 million. Give me your thoughts on J.D. Martinez and that move. Um, I'm interested to see how it pans out. I really am. I'm, I think that, um, you know, I, I was going over some of his numbers and things like that, um, you know, right before we started. And and one thing that I noticed that was kind of interesting, and, and maybe I'm looking too far into it, um, but every time he goes to a new organization and changes environments, he improves. Yeah. Um, from from the previous kind of gets year. a liar uh, a light uh, looks like it gets a, a fire lit I should say yeah 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 because he went from the you know from the Astros um, in the early 2010s uh, went to the Tigers and the Diamondbacks um, and then the Red Sox um, and when he went from the Astros to the Tigers he improved um, the Tigers and the Diamondbacks were both in 2017 so it, it stayed pretty similar um, then when he went from the Diamondbacks to the Red Sox um, he improved again um, but then he can he degressed after he progressed. Yeah, um, right. So <laughs> I'm 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 curious to see kind of what happens in a in a new uniform. Yeah, no doubt. I think I've made it pretty obvious. My intentions were clear that I wanted Justin Turner re-signed. I thought he was worth the original sixteen million. If you look at what he did last year offensively, you know he was the seventh highest paid defensive third baseman. But yet, if you look at that, you know definitely certain metrics, but a lot of the different metrics, if you equate them out over regular seasons, postseason, you could still say that he's the best defensive third baseman in the game. I think the Dodgers should have resigned him one because I still think he's very good, and two because I think Miguel Vargas could have used that mentorship. You know, if Miguel Vargas is going to be your everyday third base. And I think that would have been a good deal for him. Okay, so some ideas on J.D. Martinez. I'm guessing that Justin Turner was offered the exact same deal that J.D. Martinez was offered one year to be the D.H. And, I'm, you know, this is pure speculation, but I would guess that Justin Turner turned that down. We see now that he got the two years, $13 million, the first year at Boston. Okay, so uh, another thing about J.D. Martinez, you know, if you go out and you get – 
free agents and you sign them, you know, the, where the Dodgers came up short last year was in the playoffs, okay? So, J.D. Martinez has been great as a postseason hitter. His slash line is 303, 391, 596, OPS of 987 in the playoffs. So, you're getting a guy that has shown up in the postseason like Justin Turner did. And then here's another one. You know, of course, the Dodgers like the short-term deals. The one-year deal, I think, is perfect. Is exactly – what they were looking for. And then here's another one. Interesting. We'll see what you, th- you think about this. Robert Van Scoyock, hitting coach for the Dodgers. He's getting reunited with J.D. Martinez. And if you remember, J.D. Martinez was almost out of the game in 2013. And he got with Van Scoyock in the offseason. They just they, – they revitalized his swing. He kind of was ahead of his time in, in, the, in the launch angle era, if you will. Van Scoyock just – he changed his swing. And J.D. Martinez is really quick – to give him a lot of credit, Van Scoyock, for the success he had. So it's a, you know, it's a reuniting of J.D. Martinez and Van Scoyock. So for all those reasons, I think that's why the Dodgers pulled the trigger. So what are your thoughts? Uh, I didn't know that actually going into this. And that's pretty interesting. Um, you know, I think that um, being reunited with that hitting coach that kind of, you know, a little fire under you and, and, and turns you into something pretty special, um, which I think we can we can both agree that he has been um, in, his, in his previous years. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens. Um, I wonder if he can, you know, kind of kind of turn him. I wouldn't say turn him around, but make him even better than he than he was um, yep. in these last few years with with the Red Sox. Um, and, and if he can, that's, that's going to be a, that's going to be a big time bat, um, you know, in the, in the offensive lineup, um, which, which really, um, when, when you lose Justin Turner and, and a couple other guys, you wonder how good offensively, you know, the Dodgers are going to be, um, with, with all those young guys. Um, so I'm interested to see what happens with that. Yeah, so the collateral damage is, you know, that just adds one more guy to the log jam when you talk about DH. You know, Max Muncy could have DH some, Michael Bush could have DH some, Miguel Vargas. So, you know, you're talking about second base, DH, third base. You have Max Muncy, Miguel Vargas, Michael Bush, now J.D. Martinez. That's four guys for three spots. So how does that rotation work? I know a lot of people think Miguel Vargas is going to play some left field, but you know, I, I don't think that's the best case scenario. I think best case scenario is leaving him in the infield. So I think if they started tomorrow, I think Muncie would be at third and Vargas would be at second right now. So what does that do for Michael Bush and his role? Um, you know, I think that he's another guy that you can throw – you can you can put in left field. Uh, I won't say throw in left field because he's – I mean, he, he plays it at a high level, um, as, as we've both seen in Oklahoma City. Um, you know, and, and I'll go back to what I said last week. These guys aren't just good – second basements or third basements are good baseball players. Um, so I think that um, maybe while Michael Bush's role may be um, a little less than expected going into the season, I still think that he's going to play a significant role. I think he's going to get a lot of time, and I think he's going to, to gain a lot of, of, of good experience um, that's going to be much needed, you know, especially in these upcoming years when – you know, I mean, you only signed J.D. Martinez to a one-year deal. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it could possibly be that that he goes in to be a mentor for um, whoever that whoever that next left fielder is going to be. Um, you know, like I said, I'm I'm just I'm interested to see, um, you know, kind of kind of what they do with the young guys at this yeah. point when you're signing a a 35 year old. So. Yeah, and I just, I just, I think you're robbing Peter to pay Paul if you're if you're taking Trace Thompson and or Chris Taylor out of left field and putting Miguel Vargas and or Michael Bush there. You know, I, I don't know if that's a trade off that's that over a long haul is advantageous for the Dodgers. So I do think there's a log jam there when you look at left field because I do think James Outman's going to get a lot of time in center field. I think it would be best for the club if they just put James Outman in center field and let him go and you know let him play through all the rookie you know if you will just kind of just getting comfortable time you know in the adjustment period so i think in left field if you look at chris taylor trace thompson second base third base dh then you have the four guys we talked about you know there's a log jam there so it's going to be interesting to see how doc handles that but hey we're going to move on to miguel vargas i know people are very high on him and of course michael bush like miguel vargas and max muncie as well if they if they if they stick in a major league lineup which we all think they will it's it's going to be because of their offense and we've seen how good miguel vargas plays offense he was the 2021 
double A central champ, a hitting champion, and then this last year he hit over 300 in triple A. And so we've seen his offense, and we are going to break down some of his offense in video tonight. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to show a whole lot of his defense. And one thing I wanted to note, Chase, was, you know, he's played a lot more second base than people think because if you look at his stats, you need to add some games to that because the shift last year in AAA actually had him, although he's listed as a third baseman, there were a lot of times where he was making plays from the second base position, but he was in the shift. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, and, and I think that that's that's going to be um, that's going to be crucial, especially if he's playing second base. You know, he's he's had, um, like you said, a little bit more experience than what people would think there. Um, and then playing him in that shift, I, th- I think will will definitely help him. You know, because balls are coming at different angles and all kinds of stuff. So, um, and I, I don't think people realize how hard it is to go. You know, each each of the different spots in the infield, they're so much different. So. Mm-hmm. No doubt about it. And I, I put out a tweet tonight about Gavin Lux and the difficulty of, you know, trying to move to second base at the major league level, a position he never played, and then doing it on a World Series team where you don't feel like you could make mistakes, you know. So that kind of deal. But, hey, you ready to break down some Miguel Vargas video? Let's do it. All right, so let's get going. As you can see, I mentioned, you know, the shift in AAA last year. He's, you know, he's listed as a third baseman there, but making a play from the shortstop position on the move. So, Chase, as we roll through this, give us your thoughts. There's another shift from the shortstop spot. Yeah, I, I really like the way that he comes to the baseball. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, he's, he's definitely not afraid to go and make a hard play. Um, just, just within these first, you know, two, three – Four videos. Th- these are not. Field level. Yeah. These are not. You know. Average. You like that arm from field level there. I do. I like it a lot. These aren't. These aren't just average plays. These are hard plays to make. Moving left. Moving right. Uh, backhands. Um, you know, working through balls. Um, he, he. I mean, he's like I said. He's a really, really good baseball player. Um, this is not a highlight that, video, by the way. This is again. There's an error. You can tell. This is. This is every play that he made for like a three week span. Yeah, it's I, he. I think defensively, there we we should have no concern if he's our if he's our everyday second or third baseman for that matter. I, I really like his glove. There's another shift right there, and you know one of the knocks on him, if you read scouting reports, is the footwork. You know, is his footwork to you? Does it look quick enough to be a high level major league third baseman? I think I think with some of these plays that we're seeing, I, I, I really I think that I think that he's going to find a lot of success. Um, you know, and, and guys are are probably running a little bit faster, and balls are are being hit harder, and things like that. Um, but I think that you know, uh, along with the rest of these young guys, you know, with with a lot of quality quality reps, I think that he'll be just fine. There's one at second base. That's what I'm talking about. There were a lot of plays that he made. At second base, you say, well, the Dodgers are working. There's another one at shortstop. The Dodgers are working Vargas out at second base, and you go and you look at the game logs, and it lists him at third base, so there's another one. Okay, He was actually listed as the third baseman on those plays but made the play from a second base position because he was in a shift. So, you know, having to play up the middle like that, you know, Vargas obviously has had to use the footwork. So tell us what you think. You know, there's a lot of plays – from third base, you have to come in on like this one right here, and you have to throw on the run. What do you think about him making that play? It, I mean, it looks it looks almost natural to him. I, I think that um, you know, I think that there could be maybe a There's little one bit left more. field, by the way. Yep, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, again, it's it's just proven that these guys are good baseball players. I think there could be a little bit more arm strength there, um, but I, I think that you know with with being at the at the major league level, I think that they'll recognize that work on it with him, and I don't I don't think it'll be an issue. Thirty games through the season. Now here's another one left field feeling for the wall. That right there tells you know when you get to the warning track and you're comfortable enough to relax. You know a lot of people panic when they get towards that that wall. That that tells me right there he has a great awareness of where he's at on the field. Here's another thing, too. If you look at the footwork, he does not take anything for granted. You know, he's not so great that he feels like he can just not be mechanically sound. So if you look at his footwork every time, like just like that, you know, he had, a, of course, that throw was high, but he had a lot of time to make that play, but he did not take it for granted. He got his feet up underneath him and got his shoulders squared to throw. Yeah, I, I think that, Man, I, I really like his glove work. I like how yeah. he, you know, pushes through baseballs and and um, 
just coming across, coming through, but th- coming through balls. I mean, he's making he's making these. Um, That's not deep so there routine. too. I mean, it's not like he's even with the bag. He's deep. Yeah, it's, it, he's making these not so routine plays look routine um and, and i think that that's definitely going to help him um especially when he's playing you know in front of a whole bunch of people and and the the moments are big and things like that i think that if he sticks true to his mechanics like he's doing in these videos he's going to find a lot of success i like that angle there that, that i know he, that was up the line which i'm not concerned about i mean errors happen you know that's yeah. not the point of watching that play the point is you get to see the arm strength from field level even on that play you know like like I said, we've seen him go to his left. We've seen him go deep to his left. We've seen him play from the second base position right there. That's the one I like. Look at him feed second. And you know as well as I do, when you feed second base like that, you know, your throw has to be made pretty much before you catch the ball by getting your footwork. I like that spin to the glove there. Your footwork has to be done before you catch the ball. And I like the way that he was moving his body towards second base with his footwork to, to make the feed a lot easier. Yeah, and and one thing that I want to point out is as we just saw, you know, that play right there. Um, yeah, I think I think he's a high quality outfielder too. Um, I think that he he gets good reads on balls, and I think that um, I I think he feels comfortable anywhere he's at, or at least mm-hmm. it, it's what it makes it look like. Um, you know, the the ones that we just saw earlier, feeling for the wall. Um, there's several diving plays that that I've seen him make that. Um, not not very many people are able to make um and and, and uh man he, he just makes it look easy yeah so you know there's your video defensively of miguel vargas and mentioned you know if miguel vargas is going to stay this is a walk-off this is an electric moment you could tell very excited i wanted to show that entire walk-off just how much fun that he has playing baseball that's another thing if you watch miguel vargas His fun energy is very contagious. He's just a wonderful young man. He has a great time playing the game, as you can tell. You can tell his teammates love him, so there's some intangible aspects to his game. But let's move to his offensive aspect, which, you know, he is just a machine at the plate, and uh, hopefully this will (laughs) reel through. I think I (laughs) left this one on a little bit too long, but I promise there's some more offense coming from Miguel Vargas here in just – a minute, but all right, here we go. Miguel Vargas, you saw one to left center. Now here's one to right center, man. He just wears out the gaps. He does, and I think that that's what's going to make him very, very, very good at the next level um, is, he, is he can hit to all fields, and he can hit very well to all fields. Um, you know, and, I, and I'm one of those guys where he does he has a lot of pop, um, but as I have mentioned before, you know, I like gap shots. I like them yeah. a lot, and I think that um, – you know, in times, I think they're more beneficial than home runs are. Uh, well, it's the biggest part of the field, you know, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, just him showing that he can, you know, hit hit balls to all parts of the field hard, uh, fastballs, curveball, change up. He can hit um, really any pitch you throw at him. And he has, a, I mean, he has a chance to take you deep. Um, but yeah. he also has a chance to beat you, you know, with a, with a ground ball up the middle. Uh, or with that. a gap shot, with <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he he find he finds ways to win at bats, and that's one thing that I really really do like about him. Well, and he does it. You know, a lot of guys they have an idea. See it? He came up and in, and he was able to turn on that ball. We just saw him hit a ball to right field on a on a slider low and away. Now we saw a riding four seam up and in that he was able to turn on, and it doesn't look like he's guessing. It looks like he's a good enough hitter to actually see the pitch out of the hand and adjust to the type of pitch it is and where it's located. Yeah, I think that's what um, I think that's what makes him so dangerous offensively um, is he's able to detect those things. You know, the, even the smallest, you know, he, the, the pitcher may be tipping a pitch or something, and he's able to pick up on it. Um, You know, and and it looks like he knows what's coming before the pitch is even thrown. Okay, so there's your video on Miguel Vargas. Final thoughts defensively, offensively. One thing that we didn't talk about, you know, just kind of the swagger that he carries himself with, you know, defensively in the field. Do you see that? You know, we talked about that with Gavin Lux last time. At the plate, I think it's pretty obvious he's very confident. So from a swagger perspective, do you see that too? 
Yeah, I love it. I, I think that that's one thing that I like about a lot of these young prospects that the Dodgers have is they, they there's a lot of confidence, um, you know, and they, and they just have fun. And, yeah. and when they're having fun, you know, I think that um, it allows other guys to have fun. And it also makes it fun to watch. So I think that, um, you know, while you lose guys like Justin Turner and, and some of your older guys, I think that I think that these young guys are going to be are going to be really, really good. So after seeing that, or you know, I know you've seen a lot of Miguel Vargas, but still after having seen that, more encouraged, less encouraged? How do you feel after seeing all that? You know, I I, I feel very encouraged. Really, I, I I like his swing a lot. Um, he has a he has a high quality swing, and defensively, like I said, he makes not such routine plays look routine, um, and, and he yeah. makes things that aren't very easy. Speaking from, I mean, speaking from experience, he makes yeah. them he makes them look like second nature to him. Okay, so if you're Dave Roberts, if you're the GM, Andrew Friedman, or your front office, what is your role for Miguel Vargas next year? Is he the everyday third baseman from day one? I I wouldn't see any reason why not. At least at least at this moment. So so do you try to play him a little bit? And of course, I you know I think with the rookies, I think they need to put the rookies in one spot, leave them, let them get comfortable, let them work through the growing pain. So I'm not big on playing Vargas at third base, second base, and left field and shifting him around. So are you in favor of that, or just do you want him in the lineup any way you can to get at bats? Uh, I'm not. I'm definitely not against it. I think that um, I think that he can play. I think that he can play any position at a high level, and I think a lot of it is because of his confidence. Um, you know, and, and because of that swagger, like you were talking about, he carries himself different than a lot of other people do. He seems very confident. He seems like, um, you know, kind of whenever he's on the field, you know, it, it's just him having a good time. And I think that that's going to definitely benefit his play, no matter if he's playing third, short, or I'm sorry, not short, third, second, or left. Um, and I, I think that he will do it at a high level. So I'm, I'm not against him playing all three. So if he's a third base, that probably puts Max Muncy at second. What does that – again, we're going to re- revisit this. What does that do to Michael Bush? <laughs> yeah, I mean, hit, Michael Bush is good, man. That dude can hit. He is. And, and you know, it's a really good problem to have. You know, it is. You have a lot of good young prospects um, that are going to play a role for you in some way, shape, or form. Um, so I wonder if that puts Michael Bush in left. I wonder if it puts him – um, sometimes at second base. I wonder if it puts him, you know, as a DH sometimes to, to steal some ABs. Um, I think that they'll find a way to get him the experience needed um, because I think that um, I think that they know that he's going to play a major role for them here in these next couple of years. Yeah, no, definitely in the next couple of years. The question is next year. But what I do think it does is it, it makes it very, very difficult to get both Miguel Vargas and Michael Bush at the same spot defensively in the lineup every day. I think, you know, because you're going to have to eliminate either Max Muncy and or J.D. Martinez at that point because if you put Bush at second, Lux at short, and Vargas at third, okay, then that leaves one spot between Max Muncy or J.D. Martinez for the D8 spot. So I do think the Martinez pickup was is a situation that that makes it to where one of the two, Michael Bush and or Miguel Vargas, they don't play every day and they definitely don't do it at the same spot. That concerns me. I, I'm just I'm not real big on that, but we'll see how that goes. Okay, so let me just throw out a the- theoretical lineup here. Okay, so you've got Max Muncy at second, Gavin Lux at short. Miguel Vargas at third base. Is that an infield that can win a World Series? <laughs> you know, I, now, there's a lot of offense there. We know that. There is. Um, and I, I think that kind of the reaction that you just saw from me is going to be the reaction of a lot of Dodgers fans. Um, there's not a lot of experience there at the major league level. Um, Will there be any patience from the fans? Let's say that Gavin Lux struggles for a game and then Miguel Vargas struggles the next game. Is there going to be enough patience? Do you want – is Gavin Lux, Miguel Vargas, the left side of your infield? Will, will Dodgers Nation, will, will they be patient enough to let that happen? I really hope so. I it, it, It's going to be hard to say because we've been spoiled, man. We we really have, you know, with, with some high-quality guys. you got Justin Turner who's gone now. Um, 
Yeah, man, I yeah, I, Drake I, Turner, I hope, Corey Seager, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I I hope that I hope that they are. I really do because I think that if you give them a chance and you give them just a little bit of time, I think that that they may surprise some people. Um, and they might not be, you know, the the best. They're de- they they won't be the best in the major in major leagues. There's 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 too many high quality guys. Um, but I think that. Uh, you know, over time, when you get to you know about that about that fifty game mark and things like that, I think that you're going to see a, a start seeing a lot of improvements, and I think that you're going to see, you know, the the, the true potential of what these guys really have. I yeah. think that they may be they may be a little starstruck at the beginning. They may be some deers in headlights, and you know, it's it's different. It's a different experience, and it's it's you know, it's they may have atmosphere. moments like that. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and I and it, do I don't think that's a bad thing though. I think that's right. part of growing pains. My so. question is, will Dodgers fans be patient enough? You know, we're used to having Justin Turner at third. It's always World Series or bust for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Will Dodgers fans, you know, maybe one position okay, but if there's two positions where you have moments of deer in the headlight type of deal because you have rookies out there, we've seen the way Dodgers fans have reacted to Gavin Lux, who's had to shift positions at the major league level on world series teams is there patience enough from the fans that's that's just that's my biggest concern right there is if you play miguel vargas and or michael bush at the same time i I just don't know that dodgers fans will be patient enough to to be able to handle to let that whole process play out yeah like i said i really hope they are because i think that there is a lot of potential there and i'm 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 not being negative or any kind i'm kind of just being realistic those those first few games may be tough to watch um and and that's simply because you know you do have those you have those young guys and you have those rookies um but at the same time i I wonder if you know i hope they do i hope they prove me wrong and i wonder if they will because of the of the of the swagger and the and the confidence that they have in themselves as, as ball players um you know i wonder if I wonder if they'll just treat it like just another, you know, just another game. Good thing about it is this Dodgers front office, they always have a plan. So if their plan is to play Miguel Vargas at second base or third base, whichever, you know, they could put Muncy, just flip-flop Vargas and Muncy. One of them's at second, one of them's at third, whichever way they go, you know, and they decide to stick with that every single day. The good thing about the Dodgers is they always have a plan and they're very disciplined in carrying out that plan. So I'm not worried about it from that perspective, but, you know, we have about eight minutes left here. Okay, so let me throw another kink into this. Let me throw another wrinkle into it. What if Jacob Amaya becomes the shortstop and then Gavin Lux becomes the second baseman? What now? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's I mean, so Amaya many. needs time at major league level. He is a he is a major league shortstop. I assure you of that. So what now? Okay, I mean, there's, what do you do with this log jam? It, there's so many – but there, there's so many potential things that could happen um, that it's almost, you know, it's almost hard to keep up with and almost hard to talk about. Um, but I, I still think you, you rock with Vargas at third, um, at, at least until he, at least until he, I mean, proves to you that he can't do it. So who at second, Lux or Muncy? I'd go with Lux. And, and then and Muncy would, doesn't play because, because Martinez is your DH? I mean, they're, they're <laughs> here. I mean, here, here's my thing. You know, when I'm when I'm looking at when I'm looking. Trust at, me, this goes on every day behind closed doors, every single day. Yeah, this conversation I mean, right here. Just when I'm when I'm looking at at, at Muncie last year offensively, I'm not impressed. Not so until I, it took him about four and a half months. After the first four and a half months, he was fine. Right. I just, you know, I. I, I so think he would be the odd man out for you, is what you're saying. At no. this point, at this, <laughs> at don't this let me point, put words in your mouth. You explain it the way you want to explain it. No, I, I mean at this point, yes, and and that okay. might sound crazy to some people, and it may sound crazy to you, but that, I mean that's okay. Hot take. Um, but I, I, I'm a big fan of Miguel Vargas. I really am, and I think that if you give him just you know just a little bit of time to adjust to. Um, seeing major league pitching every day and, and playing in the big stadiums and playing in front of a lot of people. I think that he could potentially here in two or three years be an all-star. Yeah, no doubt. You know, and, and I'll say this about Max Muncy kind of to back up your point. I don't think it's as crazy as people think 
because he is getting older, I think he, out of all of them, can handle not playing every day better than everybody else. Because, you know, if you, if you start giving Miguel Vargas spotty playing time, Michael Bush, spotty at bats, they're going to start pressing. There's no doubt about it. Max Muncy and J.D. Martinez are veteran enough to where they can understand. They won't like it, but they can at least understand the situation and not press. To go to your point about Max Muncy, would that make sense? Yeah, and and one one thing that that I kind of have a question for you. Do you think JD Martinez will see any time in the outfield? I don't know because we still haven't even talked about Chris Taylor and or Trace Thompson. I mean, so you have Mookie Betts, James Outman, Chris Taylor, Trace Thompson. In my opinion, those are your four outfielders, and then you have a log jam between Miguel Vargas, uh, uh, Gavin Lux. You have Jacob Amaya, you have Max Muncy, and Michael Bush. So you have five guys right there trying to fill three spots. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's your four outfielders, and you have five guys trying to fill three spots. I think your log jam is the five guys trying to fill the three spots. Okay. And then do you think that, you know, maybe one of one of JD Martinez's roles is to, you know, possibly mentor left fielder? I think you already have those guys. I think Chris Taylor, I, I mean, but you're not to me. You're not mentoring a a rookie left fielder. I mean, it, you're talking about either Chris Taylor or Trace Thompson being in left field. Now you can say they can mentor James Outman. I'm going to tell you right now, James Outman doesn't need mentoring. <laughs> that dude can flat play defense. And, you know, he has the arm. He's one of the best athletes in the system. Defensively, he does not need any mentoring. If he were not to be an everyday outfielder for the Dodgers, it's going to be because of the swing and miss, not because. Mm-hmm of the defense. So I don't see any need whatsoever for mentoring in left field because unless you bring it, you know, like even like if you brought up a Drew Avens type, he doesn't need mentoring. I mean, that guy's experienced, man. He's he plays played at the high levels of college. He's been all the way through the system forever. He'll be just fine. So I don't see any need there for JD Martinez to mentor anybody in the outfit. And I think if it were to be somebody mentoring, I think it would probably be Trace Thompson or Chris Taylor doing it. And then there's another wrinkle to it, you know, you also have the option of putting Chris Taylor at shortstop, you know. So, I mean, the options right now are absolutely crazy. Spring training is going to be captivating on so many different levels because, you know, for the first time in a long time, there's going to be a lot of battles for positions that we talked about tonight. And and the war room every day for the Dodgers, you know, the collaboration unit and the, and the Zoom meetings between the front office and Dave Roberts, they're going to be amazing every day this year, aren't they? <laughs> I, there, there definitely will be. There's, there's a lot of, um, you know, there are a lot of a lot of log jams, but it, I, they're good problems to have because I think that there's there's a lot of talent in a lot of places. So yeah, so maybe whoever's hot offensively, that's how you figure out who to get in the lineup defensively, right? Is that one way to look at it? That's what I would go with, man. Because I, I mean, outside of you have a really, really good pitching staff, and I think that I think that um, I think that they're going to hold guys, you know, to to three or four runs a game, and uh, I think you're you're going to have to produce offensively, and I think that's how you're going to win baseball games this year. So, is has the Dodgers' offense become more dynamic? You know, we've talked about the three true outcomes: home runs, strikeouts, and walks. You know, does Miguel Vargas, Michael Bush, J.D. Martinez? Uh, Martinez struck out quite a bit last year, but in the past, you know, let's say that he regains all of his true form and he gets with Robert Van Skoyak and and it gets reunited and he's back to say he was when he was 30 years old, at least for one year. Okay, does the Dodgers offense become more dynamic than it was last year, do you think? I think it does. I think there's a little bit less uh, feast or famine and I think there's yeah. I think there's a lot more base hits um, than in or doubles. Yeah, and if and if anybody's listened to this, they know they know how big of a fan I am of those <laughs> of those two outcomes. And, and speaking, like I said, speaking from a, a pitcher's perspective, there's nothing worse than getting a double in the gap. I'm I'm telling you, I'd rather give up a solo home run any day um, than a double in the gap, or even you know one of those stupid duck farts that just gets a guy on base. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or or a Max Muncy. 15 pitch at bat, then he walks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that will wear you down. The Dodgers are the absolute best in the league. And that's another thing about Michael Bush 
and Miguel Vargas is that, you know, you train them up right, they will be disciplined hitters. They will not chase the zone. You don't hit as well as those two have. You know, Michael Bush hit over 400 in September of 2021. It was the most unbelievable month I'd ever seen in my life. Miguel Vargas was a double-A central champion that year, hit over 300 again this year. Michael Bush hit in the 270s. He hit, I believe, 32 home runs last year. You don't hit like that at the triple-A level and and swing at pitches out of the strike zone, do you? You, you don't. You don't. There's no possible way. I, there's a, <laughs> I keep saying it. There's a whole lot of talent with those, yep. with those prospects. There's a whole lot. Okay, final thoughts. Got about two minutes. Um, I'm I'm definitely intrigued to see <laughs> to see really how the season goes. I'm I'm definitely interested in spring training. I think there's going to be a lot uh, a lot of truth uh, coming to light in that, and I think that there's going to be a lot of you know possible answers to questions in terms of what your everyday lineup is going to be. Um, and I'm I, I'm interested to see how JD Martinez does. Yep, that is going to be interesting. Reunited with Robert Van Skoyak. And, and you know, obviously it, it, it sucks. I'm just going to put it that way to not have <laughs> Justin Turner on this team. That one stings. I mean, he was just an incredible player, an incredible ambassador to the local community. He was a wonder. I know he didn't perform the way he wanted to in the last two postseasons, but overall – He's been a hero in the postseason for the Dodgers. He has been exactly what the Dodgers are. He has been that guy. It sucks not to have him anymore, but you don't. So you got to move on. So you got to make the best out of it. I think I do like the J.D. Martinez pickup. I think his reunion with Robert Van Skoyak is going to be good. And I think it's going to be fascinating. You know, I'm, I can't wait every day to see what the lineup's going to be <laughs> because that's going to be one of the most interesting parts of it. Hey, Chase, we're out of time. Thanks again. So until next time, hey, we want to thank everybody for tuning in to the Dodgers Dogs and say, go Dodgers.